Hey, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining me for Facebook Live. My name is John Phipps, the lead pastor of Park Place Church. It's my honor to be with you this morning. I am so excited, as I always am. Uh, for those of you that don't know, I do devotions with you Monday through Friday. I'm off-site today, having a wonderful morning, getting ready for my second, second cup of coffee. Good to see you, Sandra. Thank you for joining me. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Luke. Um, we're going to be looking at chapter 6. No, Luke chapter 2. Um, yeah, Luke chapter 2. And it's going to be kind of an interesting story. Good morning, Pam and Diana and the other Pam. Lynn, Terry, Sheila, Pastor Dale. Thank you for joining me, buddy. Good to see you guys. Hope you're doing well. Well, as you're working your way over to Luke chapter 2, I just want to tell you that um, <clears throat> the Bible study last night went really well. I taught for about an hour and then I posted it to my page. So, if you don't know this yet, I taught on sex, so you might want to take a look at it, the difference between sex and love and the importance of both. Um, obviously, um, it's something that um, most of the people that were with me in person in the sanctuary seemed to really enjoy and hopefully learned a few things about. But the, you know, the interesting thing is sex is everywhere in our culture, isn't it? I mean, it all comes kind of like from Hollywood. Good morning, Pastor Pat, and I see all the other names there. Um, but we live in a sex-filled culture, a sex-filled society, and it is what it is. Um, we can't change it. The only thing we can do is change how we respond to it or how we feel about it. And I think we all have to be very sensitive to the fact that um, it's everywhere around us. Sex sells, right? Don't they, don't they say that when it comes to advertising and marketing and things like that? Um, so if you're interested in learning about this, um, look at my Facebook post last night. I posted it. It's about an hour long. Some of you are with me in person and some of you may have watched it live already. Anyway, today we're not talking about sex. Um, so we're going to be talking about something a little bit different. Hope you guys are doing well. After I got home last night, I was so tired. I started to watch a UFC fight um, that was pre-recorded. You know how I do. And... I watched a little bit of it. I think I might have fell asleep by about 9.30. Um, but I knew that I had a big day today. I got some things uh, off campus to do, which I'm really excited about. And um, actually helping uh, a friend today. So um, it's a real honor to be able to do that. And then I had to move some appointments. Um, so uh, like I said, I'm not at my office. I'm not at the church. I'm having my second cup of coffee already. Don't judge me. And I'm going to taste it and let you know if it's good. very good it's very good very good coffee better than the first cup I had this morning very different actually normally what I drink is black coffee those of you that know me good to see you Dale thank you for joining me and Mary I drink black coffee I don't put cream sugar or anything bad in it I I'm no, no judgment if you do but um, I like black coffee I learn to get used to it I don't like it sweet anymore, um, so it's just black coffee. I have three cups a day, typically. Um, on a bad day, I'll have four. On a good day, I'll have two. All right, let's get to it. <clears throat> so we're looking at Luke 2. If I have a scribe with me, that'd be fantastic. Luke 2, verse 41. And I don't think I've shared this story with you before, but I thought we'd take a few minutes um, and just kind of um, take a good listen to um, this little boy named Jesus, okay? Uh, we don't know a lot about him um, at this point. We know obviously he is God's son, um, but Luke 2, um, um, yes, Luke 2, verse 41, and this is a great little story, and then we're going to talk about the application. I've got three scribes, four scribes on here with me today. You guys are so fast and so good. Thank you. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. Now, let me just stop right there. Good to see you, Chris. Thank you for joining me. What was Jesus like when he was 12? Honestly, come on, be really think about this for a moment. When I was 12, I was awkward. When I was 12, um, I was clumsy. I was all into basketball and sports and athletics and things like this. I wonder if Jesus liked those things. I wonder if he liked playing with the other boys, you know? I wonder if he 
had girls who had crush on him or whatever the case might be. Um, I wonder how interesting his life was before it became a public ministry. I can't help but wonder. It's There's so much in scripture that isn't shared with me that makes me wonder about who he was at the age of 12. So here he is, he's 12 years old. He went up to the festival with his parents according to the custom. Now look at verse 43. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. So he knew because he was all knowing that they had left without him, but he was more concerned about staying and teaching than anything else. I love that. I want you guys to know this is my favorite 20 or 30 minutes of my day. It always is. Now, to take nothing away from Sweet Dina or my kids or anything else, I love teaching. I love getting into God's word and just letting him speak to my heart. And so here's Jesus. He's he's like, you know what? I'm just going to do what I want to do right now. Like, I'm not even going to really communicate with my parents what I'm doing, where I'm at. I, I, I guess maybe they know. Maybe he thought they knew. I don't really understand. But he let them leave. And so the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. Okay? Jerusalem is the holy city, God's city, but they were unaware of it. That means his parents didn't know Jesus stayed behind, and Jesus didn't let them know. Think back to when you were a kid, the times you did things and you didn't let your parents know and how they worried about you. Do you remember those times? I remember one time in particular, um, I was 16, and I had my parents' vehicle, and I was out cruising uh, Lapeer, which is a uh, hot cruising spot um, back when I was a kid. And we were cruising Lapeer, Michigan, and um, doing what guys do at that age, uh, having a great time. But there was a snowstorm, and the snowstorm made it very difficult for us to get home on time. In fact, it was an ice storm, so we had to drive really, really slow. And I got back home. Mom, you might remember this. I got back home. My mom's on here with me. Thank you, Mom, for joining me. I got back home probably like an hour or two after um, the curfew. And I remember because I had the old minivan, do you remember? And the minivan was fine, we were fine, but I drove like literally 10 miles an hour all the way home because of the, um, the ice storm. My mom was very worried about me and um, was looking out the window waiting for me. Everybody was fine, but because of the ice storm, I had to drive really, really slow. And I couldn't, at that time, have a cell phone to communicate um, you remember what it was like before cell phones. Jesus doesn't have the ability to, you know, call his mom. He didn't properly communicate with his family. So let me just say, I think in some ways, Jesus is a very typical child. I think in some ways, his parents are very typical, um, that they had a lot of other kids to worry about. Jesus was not an only child. You know, he had five brothers, and that does not even include how many sisters we have. he had, which we don't know. So he may have had five or six sisters. So we're talking a large family. They traveled in a caravan to Jerusalem and they left together in a caravan from Jerusalem. So here's Jesus. He stays behind. They were unaware of it. Verse 44, thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. So for 24 hours, nobody knows where Jesus is. Nobody is concerned at first. <coughs> Excuse me. Nobody is concerned at first where he is. Then they began to look for him among the relatives and friends. This is part of their caravan. Verse 45 says, when they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. Can you imagine the fear and the uh, trepidation of what they were feeling about where is Jesus? I mean, my goodness, can you think about this for a moment? Just put yourself in Mary's shoes. She is the mother of God himself, okay? He's missing that's not going to look very good. That doesn't feel very good. Like, okay, maybe James, okay, maybe Judas, um, maybe one of the other brothers, Joseph, okay, there was a, you know, the, the, there were five of them. I think Simon was another one. They can be missing. This is God's son. This is a little bit different. This isn't Joseph's son. This is Mary's son. This is the son of God. He's missing. We don't know where he is. He could be in Jerusalem, so we're going to go back and we're going to look for him. Now, after three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers. What does that mean? It means they did not know where to find him. Jerusalem is a very big city, 
and a lot of people were there. A lot of foreigners were there. So, t time to get the switch? Yeah, maybe so. Um, I don't know about that. But what I can tell you is um, they did not anticipate him being at the temple. Why? Because he was 12. 12-year-olds don't go to the temple and teach the teachers um, about the Old Testament prophecies and scriptures. It just doesn't happen, my friends. So I'm sure Mary and Joseph probably looked at all the places where the kids play. He's not there. Probably went to all of the people that he connected with. You know, he's not there. Went to where they were staying and lodging. He's not there. Finally, after three days, why not check the temple? Why not? There he is teaching them. It says he was sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. This is my Jesus. Verse 47. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. So it wasn't just that he was listening and asking questions. He was teaching as well. Why? Because they were amazed at his answers. So he was asking them questions, and they were obviously asking him questions, and they were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Let me tell you something. When somebody asks you a question, sometimes the best thing you can say in response to someone's question is a question. Because you are not, you are not on trial. So when people ask me things, I can choose to answer it or I don't have to answer it. It makes no difference to me because I'm not on trial. But the truth of the matter is sometimes it's more important what they think than what I think. And me as a psychotherapist or a counselor, it's important for me to get out why they're asking the questions they're asking. Good morning, Gina. Good to see you, my friend. Um, so everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers in verse 47. But in verse 48, when his parents saw him, they were astonished. They were astonished because here he is sitting with these, these Pharisees, these, these Sadducees, these scribes, different parts of the Sanhedrin, and they're just mind blown by this 12-year-old with this great learning and wisdom and understanding. Who has that at 12? I'm 47. I don't have that. Listen, my friends, I... I, I, I'm just, I, I can just imagine Joseph saying, who is this kid? Like, where did he get this understanding? Where did he get this learning? Why are the Pharisees and the Sadducees who wouldn't spend time with us as adults spending time with this 12-year-old child day after day after day, three days? Where did he sleep? We don't know. What did he eat? We don't know. Who took care of him? We don't know. Jesus doesn't seem to be concerned about that, but they were amazed at his wisdom. The parents were astonished. And then she said to him this, which is interesting. This is a question, and he does answer her. And he is not being disrespectful, I don't, I don't believe. Jesus would not be disrespectful, but the question is this. Son, why have you treated us like this? So she's thinking about what she's feeling. She's not thinking about what he's feeling. Sometimes you guys need to stop thinking about what you're feeling and start placing more emphasis on the circumstances around you and what other people are feeling. So you need to be less emotional and more empathetic. And Mary was only concerned at that point with what she was feeling because she was a mother who had lost a son. So I'm sure she was feeling very anxious. So she says to him, son, why have you treated us like this? You've got five brothers. None of them have treated us like this. Only you, Jesus, treated us like this. Basically, that's what she's saying. Your sisters, they were compliant. Your brothers, they were compliant. You were not. Why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Yeah, searching for three days. Jesus said in verse 49, why were you searching for me? Again, Jesus doesn't answer her question except with a question. So what does that tell you? It says that she asked the wrong question. So actually, Jesus answers a question 
with a question throughout his public ministry. And I love the fact that he does it here at the age of 12, and he does it when he's 30 in his public ministry as well. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Now, another translation says, didn't you know I needed to be about my father's business? I like that. Some of us need to be in our father's house on Sunday, Wednesday, Tuesday. We all need to be about our father's business. I took a big sip because I got a big cup and it's really good coffee and I'm really enjoying it. They're making fun of me. Anyway, it is what it is. It's really good coffee. Are you about your father's business? Jesus said, didn't you know I needed to be about my father's business? Absolutely. What would Mary say? Oh, that's right. You're the son of God. Forgive me. Forgive me for overreacting because I didn't know where you were for three long days. Forgive me for overreacting because I didn't know where you were. I don't even know what your father's business is necessarily. I don't even know how you interpret your father's business. All I know is I was anxious and you're not answering my question. In fact, you answered my question with a question. And so I love that. But they did not understand what he was trying to say to them because they didn't have the capacity to understand at that point that a 12-year-old would be about his father's business. Some of you need to be about your father's business. Some of you need to be less concerned with your business, less concerned with your family's business, less concerned with... Um, the national business or the politics that are going on in our country, which we have no control over, and be about your father's business. Because your father's business is business number one. If you love God, be about your father's business. If you love God, be about that which he's called you to do and not that which brings you the most pleasure. You see, it would have been easy for Jesus to be compliant. It would have been easy for Jesus to leave early or to go with his family. Now, yes, he should have communicated. It was an oversight, most likely. But nevertheless, let's not blame him for that. Okay, he is the son of God. But one thing I do know is that we need to be about our father's business. We need to be about the things that God has called us to do, the things that God wants us to do, the things that God is leading us, guiding us to do. Why? Because we are created for such a time as this. Our mission statement, helping people find and fulfill God's purpose for living. The action statement, go do it. Once you know your purpose for living, then God says, be about my business. Go and do the business that I've called you to do. Go and do what I have set you apart to do and not do the things that you want to do. Now, I'm not saying you can't have any fun, and I'm not saying you can't do things that you enjoy, of course, but you need to be about God's business first. If you're about God's business first, getting into the Word, praying, spending time with Him, spending time with His people, going to church on Sunday, putting God first, then everything falls from that. And I think joy comes as a result of putting God first, yourself, and others second. What is the first and greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Absolutely. So, then he went down to Nazareth with them, which is where he was raised. He was obedient to them. But his mother treasured up all these things in her heart and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with both God and man. I love that. It's a wonderful closing scripture. So here's Mary. Just She's processing. She's just trying to work through this. She's thinking about these things. But it's wonderful because she's beginning to understand that whatever is happening with Jesus is far bigger than her. Listen to me, my friends. Whatever is happening in your life, whether it is unpleasant or pleasant, whether it's difficult, challenging, whatever, is beyond your ability to understand. Sometimes we just need to rest in the fact that we don't have to understand the details or try to figure it out. God doesn't give us the blueprint. God points you in the direction and says, go. He doesn't give you 
a um, blueprint. God doesn't go through and make sure that you're okay with each step and you know you understand the process. No, we we walk by faith, not by sight. And sometimes we don't know exactly how we're supposed to walk. But if he leads us, then he will lead us and we will follow because we are faithful. So my friends, I want to pray with you. And I want to remind you that even if you don't understand God's plan, God's plan is to help you find and fulfill God's purpose for living. And then he says, go and do it. Some of you are called to ministry, but you're not doing it. Some of you are called to do certain things in your marriage or to apologize to people that you've been estranged with, family members. Some of you are called to do specific tasks, but you're not doing them. Some of you are called to do things by God, but you're not doing them. Some men are called to pray over their wives, but they're not praying over their wives. Women are called to support and honor and care for their husbands, but they're not doing it because they're holding resentment or anger or something like that, who knows. But whatever God is calling you to do, do it, and that's where joy comes, my friends. So let me pray with you. Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for the 25 people that are on with me this morning. I pray, Lord, like Jesus, we would be <clears throat> about our Father's business. Whatever that is, whatever it looks like, whatever it feels like, God, we would put that first and foremost, and that we would do the very best we can with his business. It's not our business. It's his business. Jesus didn't say I needed to be about my business. He said my father's. So we say the same thing this morning. We want to be about our father's business. As much as we can understand it, as much as we can receive it, we want to be about his business. And his business is better than ours. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good to see you, Carrie, and all of you guys that are on here with me. I know there's going to be another 150 people that are going to watch this. It's amazing to me how many people listen to these simple devotions and get a little something out of it. It's just a simple lesson. It's a reminder to us that we need to be about God's business, whatever that is. Please share this if you want to, and um, you can post it to your page. A lot of people will go on the um, Park Place page, and they'll, they'll watch it tonight when they get home from work. That's fine. I hope you guys have a wonderful day. Today is Thursday, so I'll be with you again tomorrow from um, the comfort of my couch. And um, I will look forward to it. Nothing going on tonight. Had a good Bible study last night. Like I said, I taught on love and sex. And if you want to watch that, you can. It's on my Facebook page. Have a wonderful day. I love you guys. Be blessed.